So this video is about the frequently asked questions by expat parents regarding public schools in Portugal. I had the opportunity to talk with the public school director and get some answers to those questions, so let's jump into them. Is it possible to visit the schools and is there a presentation of the school day? Normally, there is an open school day where all the parents and kids can come and visit the school. And also there is a big event in Lisbon in the exposition center where parents and students can go and see the different schools and their offerings. Due to the current circumstances, these events aren't happening and they're also not happening in a virtual environment. How do I find the school agrupamento for my kids and the place that I live? There's actually a website online where you can search for the school agrupamentos and the place that you're living. I did a video on how to register your kid and I also walked through that tool. You can see it up here. If you get value out of this video, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel so you can join the journey of us, a family of four, moving to Portugal. If I arrive in the middle of the year, can my kid get registered and start in that school year? Yes, you can. What do I need to be able to register my kid in that school? So you, can, you actually can do it in two ways. The first way is you need a proof of residence. So you can get that from the site of Finanças and get a, domi a document that's called Domicilio Fiscal and that will prove that you live in that location. There is a second option to get that document in which you go to a Junta de Freguesia, which is basically the town hall there, and you take two witnesses that can prove that you actually live where you are giving that address. That's two ways to get that document. Another document that you need to bring to complete the registration is you need to bring your school documents from your previous school so there can be a the process of equivalence. So basically looking at the school history of your kid and being able to determine which year he should be joining in Portugal. When do I know if my kid made it to preschool or for the first class in the first cycle? So the school, the process is once they get the registrations, by the end of May, they will publish a list of everyone that requested to be registered. And then uh, in the beginning of July, they will publish the list of all the kids that made it in that school. There is several criteria that helps decide if your kid makes it to that school or not. The first one is if he is in that school agrupamento. And the second one is if he has a sibling already in that school that's going to help them prioritize them. When you apply to schools, you can apply to up five schools uh, in your residence area, but also outside your residence area. What happens if you try to register in a school and is overcrowded? So first of all, this is not a common situation. It probably happens on the schools that have a lot of demand. But the first thing is that you subscribe to, you, you try to register in five schools. So it will be jumping from your first option to the second, to the third, to the fourth, to the fifth. If in the extreme rare case that after the fifth, you still do not have a placement, you can do, you can reach out to the Direção Geral de Educação and ask for assistance, either via phone or email and ask for their support to figuring out what's happening and how to get the placement in the right school. Do they teach English at school? Yes, they teach from the first cycle all the way to the secundario. What type of support is offered for students do, that do not speak Portuguese? So the schools have this uh, discipline called uh, Português não língua materna. So Portuguese not being your born language. And what happens is that when you join a school that has this program, you have an assessment. You're done an assessment to see how do you understand Portuguese? Can you write Portuguese? Uh, can, you write, uh, can you read Portuguese? And from that assessment, they give you kind of a level. So let's say you do not know anything. The kid does not read, understand or speak Portuguese. So then you're in the assessment level A1. If you know a little bit, you might enter in the level B1. And if you already comprehend and can speak it, you will be on C1 level. 
And what happens is that you have a teacher that will be giving you support to get your Portuguese up to speed. But one thing to pay attention is that not all schools have this program available. So you always need to call the school and ask if they have support para português como língua não materna. And see if they go beyond the assessment, because some schools just do the assessment, but they don't actually give you follow on support. So you actually want the two of them. You want a school that does the assessment, but it also has a teacher dedicated to help you uh, improve your Portuguese up the levels. Another thing to consider is if your kid is going to be in ninth grade, when you do the national exams, the Portuguese exam that kid will be doing will correspond to his level of Portuguese. For older kids that are on the eighth grade and above, can they still join a Portuguese public school? So the answer here is there isn't a black or white answer because it really depends on several factors. Depends on the kid, depends on the school system, um, and you need to keep in mind that kids are really resilient, so a lot of them actually succeed pretty well catching up the language really fast. And the other thing is that on the exams they will be doing, the national exams they'll be doing, for Portuguese they will only be assessed on their level. So they will do the assessment of Portuguese as lingua non materna and they will only do the exam for the level they are at. And as always, you can supplement with a tutor privately in your house, helping him, giving them extra support to catch up even faster. How big are the classrooms? So normally you can expect between 22 to 24 kids, but it might change from school to school. And one thing to keep in mind is if in that class there is a kid that needs special, special educational needs, those classrooms will be a little bit smaller to be able to support that kid. What is normally the layout of the classrooms? So if your kid is in the first cycle, it really depends on the teachers because the teachers might want a U format or they might want the traditional kids looking at the teacher. So it really depends on the teacher's preferences. After the first cycle, because you have several teachers interacting with your kids, is always normally to see the traditional format, everyone facing the teacher. What are the teacher certifications and what are the requirements for them to get hired? So first of all, the teachers, in order to be hired, they need to have formation certified by the teachers association. And the next one is that they get, if they want to grow up on their career, they must continuously do training and they do a minimum of 50 hours a year. And also, if they want to go to higher levels, they even have uh, an observer come to their classes and see their teaching style and see how they can improve and become better. How is the relationship between the parent and the teacher? And how do you communicate between the parent of the teacher? So in the first cycle, you basically have a daily interaction with the teacher because there's one teacher for the class, you see them at pick up, you see him a drop off, and there's also assessments being done every three months, so you get the sense of how your kid is doing, and there's also a designated day a week that you can go and talk to them. Things change a little bit when your kid goes into the uh, second cycle in secundario, because there you start interacting with several teachers, there isn't only one. So that's why it exists the concept of a director of class and that is the point of contact. If you want to reach out to them, your kid has a document called Caderneta do Aluno and you can require, you can write on that Caderneta do Aluno that you have something to tell them or they have something to tell you. So that communication goes through that document. If you want to have a talk directly with them, then you probably need to communicate through the school email and let them know that you want to have a chat with them. How the first cycle schedule looks like. So it starts at 9 a.m. and then they have classes until 10.30. Then they have a 30 minutes break. They come back to class uh, at 11 and they have classes until 12.30. Then from 12.30 until 1.45, they basically have lunch and a break. And what we are told is that kids are so excited to have a break that they eat in 15 minutes and rush to the playground to play until 1.45. And then you have classes until 3. 
And then after three, if you have uh, supplemental classes, you will go to those until five. On the first cycle, normally after school, again, depending on the school that you are, exists uh, after school activities. And these are activities in which the kids can be learning English, they can be learning music, they can do, be doing art projects or can, they can do physical education at that time. Student conflicts and bullying. How is that handled in the schools? So first of all, many schools have workshops and actually the police department comes in and talks about bullying and the consequences and also talks about what is to be a good citizen to educate the kids on the right behaviors. Now, on the first cycle, you see much less conflicts because it's one teacher and that teacher understands really well the class dynamics and can really jump in and intervene when needed. Now, when you go to the second cycle in secundario, because there are several teachers and the classes are bigger, the kids are spread all over the place. So it's very hard to understand the dynamics. But there is auxiliar people that are on the playground seeing what's happening. And if they see something happen, what they will do is document it and bring it up to the school director. And the school director, what will do is bring the kids that committed the offense and the person that was bullied and call them in with the parents to see if they can resolve that issue. Now, if there is a kid that is a repeated offender, what might happen is that these complaints are sent to the agrupamento director and he will make a call of what's the disciplinary action taken against that kid. It can be that he starts doing community work to be more aware of the social dynamics and have more empathy for people. Or it can be that he has a cool off period of not coming for school for a couple of days so he can cool down. Or it can be an extremely rare scenario that he gets expelled from the school. How are the public schools adapting to the current world situation we are all facing? So what the schools are doing is what's called a phased schedule. So basically, instead of kids coming all at the same time and crowding all the places, they're coming in different slots of time and joining their classes. So basically, they are in little bubbles. And these bubbles will go at different times to the playground, they will go at different times into cafeteria, and they will exit the school at different times. So the idea here is to separate these little bubbles and avoid contamination. What do schools do to stimulate art and creativity on kids? So from the first class until the fourth, uh, they have one hour a week, a teacher that comes in to do art projects with them, to have music sessions, to really broaden their scope and their creativity. How do schools do uh, and do they even do social emotional teaching? And the answer is yes. Several schools have programs and workshops where they te teach kids to be respectful towards each other, to be good civil citizens, also to respect animals, to have proper body hygiene, and for the older kids, also about sexuality. What is the support from schools for special needs kids? And here, the first thing you need to do if you have a kid with special needs is have a report from the doctor calling out the, the, the educational challenges he has and the types of support he needs. And you bring this document into the school and you work together with the school administration to create a plan to best support him. So it's kind of a one to one by one cases, and each case is different. The, only, the thing that we know is that when there's a special needs kid, ideally the school needs to reduce the size of his class so the teacher can better support that kid. Sending your kid to public school in a new country can be really scary, but I hope this video brought you information that is helpful and as well never forget that this is a collaborative solution and you need to partner with the teachers and with the school administration to make this transition really easy always have open communication with them and talk with the teachers with the school administration see the support that you can get and you'll find win-win solutions and as well before enrolling your kids make sure you call to the schools and try to identify the ones that have the programs of the 
Portuguese uh, not as lingua materna, so you can get that support as well for your kid. And don't forget that even though you're putting him in public school, you can always supplement with tutors. They're very affordable in Portugal and really good quality that can give a one-on-one -on -one personalized assistance to your kid. And it's extremely helpful. Thank you very much for watching.